I can remember the day of choosing medicine. The headmaster, a rather austere figure, came into the chemistry classroom and said, Ratcliffe, could I have a word? And I followed him out of the classroom. He said, Ratcliffe, I think you should study medicine. He, he wasn't the sort of guy you challenged. So I said, yes, sir. And that's what we did. We struck out chemistry and wrote medicine on the university forms. And that's where I uh, ended up in medicine. I've liked it, although we never quite knew whether he thought I would be a bad chemist, good chemist or a bad doctor. And to be perfectly clear, I don't think we know that now. Well, I think medicine has so many facets. I, I've done uh, several of them. I, I've um, worked in, in research, in discovery science, uh, as you know, and that's why I'm here today. But uh, that wasn't my um, medical part. I, I trained as a kidney specialist. I've done a lot of acute diagnostic medicine. That, that's quite fascinating, quite challenging. I've enjoyed that, bedside teaching of medical students. I think it's the breadth of, of medicine that, that, that's so fascinating. So the science, of course, is, is, is quite a different way of life. And uh, I've had the great good fortune of being able to practice medicine and be a scientist. We just carry on. I'd have to correct the first. Um, people have asked me, uh, were there eureka moments in your work? Um, there were, there were several. They were not sheer brilliance. They were stumbling around and eventually recognizing that something that had been actually almost obvious was there before you. In biology, I'm not talking about chemistry, physics, they're quite different subjects. But biology is, is very complicated. You're made by Darwin in evolution. You're not actually a logical way of doing what you do. You are fit for purpose. So it doesn't help to be terribly clever, to be absolutely brilliant, to be terribly logical. Just have to do experiments and observe the results and draw your simple conclusions from those experiments. That, that's what we do. Well, I, someone who's very kind to me at the start of all this was Sir David Weatherall. I, I had um, a slightly unusual entry to this. I, I, I'm a physician, I trained as a physician, and, and I had this idea to work on erythropoietin, which is a little bit unusual. That was very important because it's a relatively small field. Um, but I needed um, someone, I needed an institute, I needed an infrastructure which actually knew about molecular biology. And uh, David Weatherall and also John Bell, who had one of the labs in David's institute, uh, very kindly taught me the technology that was necessary for the molecular approach to uh, erythropoietin regulation. So they were very important people. I should just qualify the, 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 uh, the word mentor. Um, they, the, the people who were helpful were those who built confidence. Now, in some respects, a mentor is, is someone who might guide you to the right field or, or the right area. I don't think that's very good because it almost certainly will guide you to field that's already occupied by others. So they're really helpful people are those that give you the confidence, but allow you the completely free choice. That was important to me, that, that people were kind to me in that way. Well, I think it's a, I've had a terrific time in science and medicine, so I'd recommend it to anyone, really. Um, as I said just now, the accent is on find your own question. You must do that. Um, you have to acquire the technical knowledge, but the application is yours. You own your destiny. Do your own thing, confidently. They're often rather unreasonable people, you know that. You know that. Reasonable people don't discover the North Pole, they don't discover the South Pole, they don't cross deserts, climb mountains, and they don't discover, well, to a first approximation, they don't discover things in science. Most of us scientists are in 
in some way unreasonable people who don't fit the mould. And uh, I, I guess for the young people, it's important to support them in their unreasonable behaviour. Someone will always say, it's not worth doing, it's going to be done by other people, it can't be done. All sorts of reasons for not doing research. So it's only the unreasonable people who really take it on. And also, since I have an experience in university management, I, I was uh, head of department for a while. Uh, heads of department have to know that often the most awkward people in their department are the most productive. I was very careful. I'm a, I'm a scientist, uh, that's why I'm here. So we, we, we like to be sure of our facts. So I was listening very carefully to make sure it, it really was Thomas uh, Perlman on the telephone before I, I was completely convinced. Of course, there was collateral evidence coming quite quickly in the, in the announcement over the web and, and in uh, all sorts of congratulatory notes from my friends and others uh, very quickly. So I then realized probably true, I had in fact got it. Well, uh, oxygen's uh, the, essentially powers the fuel of metabolism, which the cells need to, to grow, to make new molecules. You need it for the energy of, of movement. Uh, practically everything the body does needs energy, and that energy comes from essentially the burning combustion of, of oxygen. That, that uh, level of oxygen to support the energy needs, but not to cause uh, trouble, it has to be precisely right. So we discovered a system akin to a thermostat for temperature, but for oxygen, by which the cells sense the level of oxygen and make hundreds or thousands of responses to adjust their metabolism, their behavior in many, many ways to the level of oxygen or to adjust the level of oxygen to what they need, both types of adjustment. Is the practical use of our research, well, uh, I think the researchers, we've been very fortunate. We, we didn't anticipate that we would find as the oxygen sensor an enzyme. An enzyme is a biological catalyst and these enzymes are often the targets of drugs. And, and this enzyme, your oxygen sensing enzyme, is a classical drug target. And, and, and that means that we can alter that thermostat for oxygen with a drug mimic uh, the body's natural response, say, to low oxygen and improve the adaptation to diseases which involve low oxygen. And many, many diseases have low oxygen hypoxia, we call it, as a component. So anemia, for instance, uh, can be improved by drugs which mimic hypoxia, make the body think it has less oxygen and move up the level of red blood cell production. And those drugs, in fact, are, are undergoing uh, what we call late stage trials in the US and Europe. They're actually licensed for the treatment of, of uh, the anemia complicating kidney disease, uh, which is uh, due to low erythropoietin levels in, in, in Japan and, and China. Um, of course, with all new drugs, there are uncertainties and we'll know over the next so many years, whether this is a blockbuster cure for all sorts of low oxygen diseases or, or whether it's difficult to do that safely and the indications have to be restricted. I think there's a good balance. Uh, you ask about basic research versus applied research. Uh, research has to start with the basic uh, facts. I actually would prefer to call it passion-driven research. I've heard a lot of terms for this, curiosity-driven, bottom-up, basic research. I, I don't think they convey to the average person the reasons why we do this. We, we discover things. That's what we like to do. We get passionate about doing it. And uh, this is uh, an important principle that um, People work in this way and they find things out. That knowledge, as long as it's secure knowledge, other people build on in often quite unexpected ways. And, and, and our work was, was really unexpected. We started to work on erythropoietin. We found this general system 
that was a surprise. To our surprise, also, it, it was an enzyme that, that uh, could be targeted by drugs. So those are all examples of passion-driven research that turned out to have that utility uh, that, science, that, that society is rightly uh, seeking. But I'm, as you see, I'm, I, I, I believe things do begin with that basic principle, get the knowledge right and many people can build on it. <laughs>